And I'm going to go ahead and pray for Miss Anna, all right? Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this night. We thank you for this fellowship and this great time of fun. Lord, I just pray that now that that time is over, we would open up our hearts and our um, ears to what Miss Anna is going to say. God, I just pray for every single uh, student in this room, God, that you would just offer something specifically for their situation. And I pray for Miss Anna, Lord, that you would just use her words for your good. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys give Jordan a round of applause. He really puts his heart and soul into every game. Do you guys feel that? I feel it every week. I'm like, wow. And if you don't notice, he themes the games up with the message series. So if you can be sharp and like figure that out and tell me, I might be able to give you guys a special prize for that. But all right. Well, hey, everyone. Tonight, we're going to be talking about jealousy. And I don't know about you, but my experience with jealousy started really, really young, really early. Like I remember my first memory of being jealous or having envy began literally in preschool. Yep. I vividly remember being somewhere around, I don't know, like three years old in my preschool class. And our teacher would always make us pair up with a line buddy. Do you guys remember having line buddies in like kindergarten where it's like you were paired up with someone and anytime your class went somewhere, whether it was the cafeteria or recess or wherever, you had to be with that line buddy. And so I remember my teacher, she would always say the same thing. She'd be like, okay, everybody. She's like, find your line buddy. Make sure you hold their hand so nobody gets lost as we're going wherever we're going. This was her thing. Thing, right? And here's the thing. For me, I remember that there was this one little boy in particular. His name was Todd. And I thought he was like the coolest kid in the whole school. Never mind the class, like the whole school. So I was, in my mind, I'm like, of course Todd's going to be my line buddy, right? So I would always go up to him and expect him to be my line buddy, but Todd wanted another little girl to be his line buddy. So you can see how this story goes south very quickly. Um, and as you know me to be today, my outspoken nature didn't just appear when I turned 18. It's always been there since yay hi. So um, I went up to the teacher and I was like, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reason with her. I'm going to logic, have logic with my teacher, and I'm going to explain to her that Todd is supposed to be my line buddy. So I would, I would go up to her, and I would have this conversation, and she would, I don't know if my teacher just found me at three years old and my articulate nature or the way that I demanded this um, line buddy to be impressive, or maybe she just saw me as like the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. But for whatever reason, the next thing I knew, Todd is being escorted over to me and he is to be my line buddy to my delight, right? But I'm gonna say this real clearly. However, with a capital H. However, Todd was not happy about that. He did not want that. He had his own line buddy in mind. So instead of holding my hand, what he would do is he would just like slowly start to like work his way back up the line to like the line buddy that he originally picked. And he would leave me standing there like all alone and feeling extremely rejected and insulted. So now at this point, any shred of precociousness that I had, any shred of like, little kid maturity was gone, okay? Out came the three-year-old, meaning on came the tantrum. So I would cry and I would cry and I would cry. My teacher would panic because I wouldn't stop crying. And she would literally just like to shut me up. She would, I would remember her just taking Todd and like her hands behind his back and she's just like bringing him around to me, right? And then he's back with me. But again, Todd's not happy. So my tears are gone. I'm all smiles again. And he's just like, limply holding my hand and longingly staring at the little girl, several people up that he has a crush on in preschool. So that's when it happened, guys. That's the moment. That is the exact moment, if we're tracing it back, when I felt something that I had never felt before in my three years of life. <laughs> that awful, angry, controlling, yucky feeling in the pit of your stomach. That's the first time that I felt jealous, jealousy. And I wish I could say that that was the only time that I ever felt that way. But unfortunately, that horrible feeling had come back 
Sadly, it returned when I was in kindergarten. And it happened when a little girl that I wanted to be my best friend decided that she wanted to be someone else's best friend instead. Now, how did I handle my jealousy then? Did I cry? No. No, 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 I did not cry because now I'm in kindergarten. Now I am grown, I am big girl level. So I leveled up and handled my jealousy in a much more sinister way. I remember one day after art class that I snuck over to Allison's heart drawing. She had this big red heart in Crayola crayon and she wrote, Allison and Andrea, best friends forever. And I grabbed a black crayon and drew a giant X right over it. Now when Allison came back, she saw what happened to her masterpiece and she started to cry and she ran to the teacher. And did I feel bad? No. I went right over to Andrea and I just re-won her friendship and pretended that I had no idea what happened to the heart picture and how a black X got on it. Now, I had no clue back then, five, six-year-old Anna, that what I was experiencing was a spiritual condition of a child who didn't know her identity in Christ. And she didn't know the concept of jealousy and the fact that it was nothing new. Jealousy and envy have literally been around since the beginning of time. In fact, because of Lucifer's envy, he got demoted out of his position as heaven's worship director, and he was kicked out of heaven altogether because he wanted and claimed what God had. He wanted God's status. He wanted his power. And I want to be clear, there is a slight difference between envy and jealousy. So I'm going to explain that in case you're not sure, because we always hear those terms interspersed. Envy is the feeling of wanting what someone else has. Maybe it's their attributes or a possession that they have. But if you're jealous, you feel threatened or possessive or protective or fearful of losing your position or a situation to someone else. So one is dealing with the sin of coveting. And the other is dealing with the sin of insecurity. You know, there's, there's a, one dealing with greed, I want, want, want. And the other is dealing with, I don't know my identity right now. <laughs> I'm just feeling super insecure. Now, if you're still not really sure how those are different, I want you guys to take a look at the screen and see how Woody in Toy Story displays jealousy around Buzz Lightyear.
Your chief Andy inscribed his name on me. Wow! With permanent ink, too! Well, I must get back to retirement. Don't let it get to you. Uh, but what? I don't, uh, what do you mean? Who? I know Andy's excited about Bart. But you know, he'll always have a special place to do. Yeah, like the attic. <laughs> oh, my, that's it. Unidirectional bonding strip. This is right here, one more day. So what did you guys what did you guys notice? What did you notice that Woody did initially? What was one of the first things you saw him do in that clip? Anyone want to take a guess? Okay, he was getting jealous, but what was he doing? Go ahead, Kaylin. He got mad, and before he could get mad and before he could get, get jealous, what was he doing in the very beginning? Colton? Okay, he was laughing around with the other toys, and in doing that, what was he kind of, what was he doing when it came to Buzz? What did you notice that he was doing? He was feeling envy, but you have to do something in order. Miss Sydney, what do you got? He was comparing himself. Did you guys notice that? That whole scene where he's watching, he's watching, he's looking, he's noticing, he's taking everything in. So he spent a significant amount of time, about two minutes of a four minute clip, where he's observing and noticing the differences between himself, between Buzz, and how Andy was treating both of them, even how the other toys were treating them. Now, here's what I want to share with you about what happens in the spiritual realm when you are experiencing jealousy, all right? What our enemy, the devil, is trying to do is he wants to use something against you. He uses the tactics of comparison and insecurity to make you forget your identity as an abundant child of God. You notice in the series every week, it's an attack on your identity and a different aspect of your identity. Jealousy attacks your identity as an abundant child of God. And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit so you understand it more. But here's what you have to remember, okay? When you're starting to feel jealous, you have to remember, okay, I'm a child of God. And as a child of God, I am not neglected. I am not needy. Because I as a child of God, I am abundant and I am secure. I am not a competitor. I am meant to be other people's companion. And I'm also going to let you guys in on a little secret. Contrary to popular belief, jealousy is not a feeling that you have to run with whenever you feel it or whenever you experience it. Like you have more power over it than you realize. It's actually an opportunity for you to die to yourself and to let God flex in the abundant provision that he wants to do for you and through you for others. But first, you have to understand that jealousy is rooted in selfishness. And this is what causes FOMO to happen, not fear. All right, we hear that phrase, fear of missing out, right? I've got FOMO, and you automatically think that this happens because of fear. It doesn't. 
You're not sitting there afraid when your friends are out having fun. No, this is what you're really feeling. You are craving a selfish desire. You want to have an experience that other people are having. You really just don't want other people to have that experience if you don't get to have it. And it's rooted in the sin of coveting. Coveting, you get jealous because you want it. So what we see in the Bible of jealousy starts early, starts in the book of Genesis, as you imagine, since this is such an old, old sin. And we see it turn deadly in Genesis, actually. It's between two brothers. So I want you guys to flip in your Bibles if you have them or on your phone Bible. Go with me to Genesis chapter four, all right? In Genesis chapter four, I want you guys to be able to notate some of the verses that I'm going to share because I'm not going to read all the verses. To do that will take us way too much time. I'm going to notate them. I'm going to paraphrase them. I'm going to explain them. But I would love for you guys in your notes and in your Bible to mark those down. All right, so here's where we see the first two sons of Adam and Eve, all right? And they're basically living pretty ordinary lives. Adam and Eve had two sons, Abel and Cain. And Abel grew up to be a shepherd. Cain followed in his dad's footsteps and he ends up becoming a farmer, right? And then we see that the relationship with the Lord at this point in the Bible was broken. Humanity had, had been, you know, there was a broken point, but there was a relationship. It wasn't non-existent, right? So in verses three and four, we see that the two brothers bring offerings to God. And it's not entirely clear because it doesn't really say in the Bible if God specifically asked them to do that for him or if he gave them specific and special instructions on what he wanted them to bring. But we know that in verse four, God accepted Abel's offering of the best portions of the firstborn lambs of his flock. And this is probably because they were symbolic. They were symbolic of the Lord's son, Jesus Christ, who we know was the lamb of the world. It came to take sin away. He was also the firstborn son or child of the kingdom of heaven. But unfortunately for Cain, God did not accept his offering of some, uh, some of his crops. And that was something that Cain was not okay with. But let's pause here for a minute, all right? Because we got to like digest and absorb all that information. What's really interesting about that is that the Bible specifically refers to Abel's gift as, quote, the best portions of the firstborn lambs, while it refers to Cain's gift as, some of his crops. So clearly we see that Abel isn't just giving God any old offering. He's giving God the very best that he has and he's putting real effort into it. He's, he's thinking it through and he's wanting to impress the Lord and he's wanting to please him. Meanwhile, Cain is just giving God something. <laughs> he's going through the motions, right? And so this is a strong indicator of why God maybe accepted Abel's gift and rejected Cain's. With God, we know that everything boils down to the heart, right? He's looking at the heart. He's not looking at the physical gift. He knows our hearts better than we know them because he's not a fool. He knows everything. He's God. So even if Cain did have some really impressive fruit that he brought, the lack of good fruit in his own heart was very apparent to God, and he rejected the offering. Now, here's something else that's really interesting to note about what we just read. It was Cain's action, his reaction, all right? It was not one of emotional maturity. It was not one of humility. The end of verse four says a couple things. You can circle it in your Bible. It says he became very angry and looked dejected. That's just a big old word for like downtrodden and distraught and he was beside himself. But anger usually isn't the appropriate response to being called out for being disobedient in some way. You know, the healthy response is, is more about remorseful sorrow, regretting like, oh, I didn't listen to God. Anger is usually a response that's coming out of pride, right? It's a wounded pride. 
And for all we know, there could have been like sibling rivalry between Cain and Abel, at least on one person's perspective, maybe from Cain's. You know, think about it. It's like little brother is outshining big brother in front of God. I mean, like that's a lot right there. And God who notices all things, he confronted Cain. He confronted him about his poor reaction like any good and loving and responsible parent would, right? Your parents are going to call you out when you're not behaving right. Well, it's exactly what God did. So verses six and seven say this. The Lord asked Cain, why are you so angry? Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. All right, hold up here. God's response kind of starts to give us more context. It, it starts to give us a little confirmation about the situation. Notice that God says, if you refuse, circle that, if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. God doesn't say, if you accidentally don't do what's right, if you ignorantly don't do what's right. Like, no, he says, refuse. And that word indicates a prideful resistance or a willful rejection. So maybe this meant that Cain brought something other than what God had asked for or instructed. Or maybe it just meant that he was half-heartedly going through the motions and he wasn't putting his everything into it. But either way, Cain got into his own way. He made his bed and he had to lay in it. But instead of owning that reality, what did he choose to do? He chose to envy. He chose to get jealous of his brother. Just as God warned him in verse 7, sin was crouching at his door, waiting to control him. But Cain, did he subdue it? Did he master it? Huh. Clearly not, because in verse 8, it tells us that he lured his brother out to a field and attacked him and killed him. Jealousy will make you do some crazy bad stuff, like mock other toys in front of other toys to feel big about yourself, like drawing a giant black X over your classmate's artwork and then lying to her about it. Or like luring your own flesh and blood brother or sister out into the field, attacking them and killing them. We learn a lot from the story of Cain and Abel and from their example about the consuming and controlling nature of jealousy. It's a natural part of the human emotional spectrum and our sin nature loves to fuel the flame. So when you combine comparison, like we saw Woody do, Coveting and envy, you've got a pretty big crouching tiger waiting to pounce on you. And what we notice from Cain and Abel's story is that Cain is never once recorded anywhere in this story as doing any kind of personal reflection and self-inventory. Like nowhere do we see Cain processing his emotions, reflecting on them, taking them to God and discussing them. Like, no, he doesn't do it. In fact, God, in his goodness, he initiates that process and Cain just lets it go in one ear and out the other. Because in the very next verse, we see him luring his brother out into a desolate field to his demise. And here's the thing, guys. Sin breeds more sin. So he had jealousy in his heart, right? Maybe even before that, he had laziness going on. Like, I don't really want to have to give God an offering. I'll give him some of my crops, you know. And it just builds laziness, jealousy, murder. I mean, just keeps going. Sin breeds sin. In verse 9, we see that Cain continues to sin more and more. He's like, all right, I'm going to cover everything up. I got, I'm going I'm to like cover this up and I'm going to lie. So he lies. And to all people, who's he lie to? He lies to God. Not so smart, Cain. I mean, God knows everything. Cain had to have known this, but in his own sin, he still goes and lies. And God in his goodness and in his mercy and in his grace, he offers Cain a chance to come clean and to confess. In verse 9, he says, 
afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responds. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's guardian? Guys, I don't know about you, but when I read that, every time I read that, it is dripping with attitude and sass. Like literally, I'm thinking to myself, Cain, is your pride so far gone that you think you're now above God and you're gonna give him that kind of a response? Well, apparently so, because it's recorded. He did. And, and this is one reason why God had to flex. God's like, let me show you who I am. And he banished Cain. He banished him. He became a homeless drifter. And it was so bad, he was unable to harvest even a weed. This is like the master farmer who now can't even harvest a weed. And what I find astoundingly awesome is that God continues to reveal his character and his nature because when Cain appeals for mercy, because he does at a certain point, this is in verse 13, well, the Lord grants it to him in verse 15. So what do we learn about the jealousy in this, in this story is what's it gonna be for us? We've got some choices. We're not that different from Cain right? Are we going to be like him? Are we going to be devoid of any personal reflection or, or self-inventory, humility, awareness, half-heartedly going through the motions of Christianity? Are we going to be angry and wounded and resentful and jealous when things don't go our way, but they're going just swimmingly for someone else? Are we going to take matters into our own hands because we can't bear to not be in control or to get what we want? Are we gonna allow that crouching tiger outside the door a chance to come in and make itself comfortable? Or are we going to get into the habit and practice of regularly examining ourselves with the Lord? You can't just do it by yourself because guess what? Your heart is deceitful and it's gonna tell you things that aren't true. God is the truth and he's always gonna shine that on you. Are we gonna do that? Are we gonna grow in self-awareness? Are we gonna surrender our will and our emotions and our circumstances? And are we gonna get out of our own way so we can master and subdue the crouching tiger? I mean, this is a bigger problem than we'd all like to think. Because sometimes, you guys, we've heard so many sermons and so many messages that we've read about jealousy and the dangers of pride that we just tune them out. We, we literally tune them out. I mean, we can recite them in our sleep. We live in America, one of the proudest countries, nations in the world. So we're around pride, comparison, jealousy, 24-7. And we see the ugly results of it everywhere we turn. But guys, you got to guard yourself from pride because it will numb you to the warnings against it. And when jealousy starts rearing its ugly head, that's a pretty big indicator that you've got some pride going on. God tried to warn Cain, watch out. Sin is crouching at the door. And Cain didn't think that he needed to pay close attention or heed that message. And look where it got him. Homeless drifter can't even harvest a weed. <laughs> he lost everything. You don't want to get yourself there. You don't want to let that happen. Don't allow the enemy to whisper these things to you. He's probably sitting here like, yo, this message is so basic. You're a smart person. You already know all this stuff. You've worked on your pride before. You got this. Just when we start to think that way, guess what? You don't, you don't got this. I promise you that. This is why the Bible warns us about the dangerous effects of jealousy. In James chapter 3, 14 through 16, if you guys want to bookmark that, go for it. But James 3, 14 through 16 says this. If you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. For jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil of every kind. So when you give into jealousy, what you're really doing is you're coming into agreement and alignment with a victim mentality once again, 
And this mentality is going to tell you lies. It's going to tell you the lie that you're entitled to everything that others have, whether you are ready for it or not. It's also going to tell you the lie that you have this unfair injustice that you don't get to have all the things that you're deceiving yourself into thinking you deserve. And it all snowballs from those two lies. From there, we quickly become discontent. We're ungrateful for what we already have and for where God has us at the moment. And then we start to lose joy. You start to lose joy within yourself. You start to lose joy with other people. And this is how you can easily and quickly get stuck in jealousy and envy. How do you overcome it though? How do you combat it? Because it's not easy. If any of you have been jealous before, you know that it's not, as, it's not that easy to just stop, right? You keep seeing what that other person has or who that other person is that you're not, that you want, that you can't be or have, and it consumes. So how do you stop it? All right, there's a way. First, and this sounds so simple, but I'm gonna build upon it. First, to defeat jealousy, you have to have the spiritual warfare strategy of truly knowing and understanding and accepting who you are. And that is an abundant child of God. If you don't believe you're abundant, that God's gonna provide for what you need and for what you're ready for, then you're gonna believe that you gotta do it for yourself. But if you trust God, that you are an abundant child of his and he's gonna give you everything you need when you need it, you're not gonna be as tempted to be jealous because you're trusting him. So that's the first part of the strategy. But when you know that you're an abundant child, what does abundant mean? What is in simple terms, what does that mean? Marcia overflowing, right? You've got more than you need. It's coming to you. Excellent answer. So if that's how you're living, do you have enough to spare? Yeah. You might not see whatever it is, but you've got it. It's coming. God will provide. So when you have more than enough, you have enough to give to others. So this means we live generously. We don't hoard and accrue things. We don't acquire and store things up. We release and we give freely. Why? Because we are blessed to bless others. That's the whole point of it. And when we do so, we do it with whatever we have. Sometimes you don't have a lot. So what do you do then? Sometimes all you have is sincere celebration of what someone else has that you don't have. So you turn 16 and your parents are like, we're not getting you a car and your best friend gets like this brand new sports car, you're not gonna be jealous. You're gonna celebrate. Maybe that's all you have to give is celebration. Giving a high five, going over and taking a ride with them, taking pictures of them with the car, you know, saying good things about it. That's what you have to give, right? And if you're really, if you really have resources, you know, buy them maybe a keychain or something to hang from the rear of your mirror or, you know, maybe, you know, help them wash the car, whatever. You're giving. When you do that, you deactivate jealousy. It starts to retreat. It gets pushed back and it crumbles. And what I'm really trying to get at, guys, is you combat jealousy with generosity. We defeat it in that act because in the step of giving, you're denying yourself and you're allowing God to flex in breaking off spirits of poverty that deceive you into thinking that you have to have a greedy mindset and greedy actions. Listen, if you don't know what a poverty mindset is, this is what it is. It tells you that there's a limited supply of something, anything, whatever it is you want, and that you need to get it. You need to do whatever you can to get it while you can. And what that does is it ignores the truth that God's abundant supply is limitless or the truth that what is for you is for you and what is not for you is not for you because we don't need to have everything that other people have. We want them, we think we do, but we don't. According to Matthew 6, 8, God knows what you need in any given moment or season of your life before you even do. He knows what you can handle and what would be spiritually dangerous for you more than you ever could. But you have to decide 
if trusting him is what you want, or if you'd rather live a worldly existence of coveting and envying and striving and hustling to get what you want at the cost of your soul. But instead of getting stuck in the torturous act, it's a, it's a torturous rat race of jealousy, you can combat it by doing the opposite of what you want to do. So instead of trying to acquire what you want, you give. And when you give, it releases joy. Because when you're doing it in partnership with God, he's gonna empower you to feel that joy. And when you release joy, what you acquire, yeah, you actually acquire something, is spiritual strength. Because the book of Nehemiah tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. Galatians 5, 24 through 26 tells us how we are to live as Christians. And it says something about jealousy. It says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. And likewise, in 1 Corinthians 13, 4, it says this, love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud. And isn't that the greatest commandment of all? to love. You know, if jealousy isn't part of love, then we have to learn how to combat it in our lives so that we can be more free to actually love people the way that God intends for us to love. Because we can't love well when we're focused more on ourselves and on what we want instead of celebrating others for who they are and what they have. So let's not be like Cain. Let's not be like Woody, and let's definitely not be like kindergarten Anna with the black crayon. Instead, let's be who we're called to be, which is abundantly joyful children of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you with thanks and, pra and praise for you, God, for just who you are. We thank you, God, that you have answers for all things in life. When we're experiencing something, we're not alone. You, you understand and you know what to do. And you know, God, that you've given us certain emotions in life to help us, but not to control us. We don't need to let jealousy consume us. And we thank you that you've given us a way out. Your word says that you give us a way out of all temptations. And we just need to seek you. Well, tonight we learned more about our identity. We're abundant children of God. We don't need to covet or envy what other people have. We just celebrate because we know that you've got good coming for us. And it may look different, but it's for us. What is for us is for us. What is not for us is not for us. We trust you with that, God. So help us, Lord, to turn to you when we feel envy or jealousy and help us to understand more of what you want us to do with that emotion. Help us to give more. Help us to be more selfless because if we're selfish, we're gonna be stuck in jealousy. So thank you, God, for setting us free. Your son died for us to have that freedom. We gladly and freely receive it and accept it. And we pray in thanks for everything you're gonna do moving forward tonight in Jesus' name, amen. All right, Miss Rihanna, you're gonna share the highlights with us, right? Yes. All right, give a hand for Anna. That was a wonderful message. Again, something that is so needed because um, if you got a pulse, you've struggled with jealousy before. So we have some little updates for tonight. First, I'm going to give you a lowdown of what's actually happening tonight, and then I'm going to give you an update on what's happening next week and then the next week. So tonight is mentor huddles instead of small group. Woo! And if you're new here, the only rules to mentor huddles is that you go with the person of the same gender as you. So you don't actually have to go with the middle school boys leader if you're a middle school boy. You can go with a high school boys leader or vice versa. But the second rule is try to make it a little bit even. Like don't have 12 people go with one person and then the other seven leaders are by themselves. So just even it out. But before we do that, I have two announcements. The first one is that next week is our series finale of Flex, which is going to be really awesome. So make sure you guys come out for that. And then the next next week, we have testimony night. Can everybody say woo woo? Now, I didn't even know
know this. I'm giving you this in real-time information. I just learned that the person giving the testimony in two weeks from now is Rayleigh Miller herself. So that'll be so wonderful. She's actually never shared her testimony before, so it'll be new for all of us. So make sure you invite your friends. You come on out. That is in two weeks from now, and we're going to have a time of worship and then sharing. So without further ado, why doesn't everyone stand, go find their leaders, and break apart? (laughs) 